Good evening, everybody. My name is Todd Scholl. I serve as the lead learner for the South Carolina Education Association's Center for Educator Wellness and Learning. You can learn more about what we do at cool.us. That's C-E-W-L dot U-S right there. Um, all of the resources that we have, including tonight's live stream, get posted on that website, along with other opportunities for in-person events like um, our trauma-informed workshop, our um, educator health and wellness day, uh, our mindfulness retreats, all that is available on the COOL website. And we just invite you to go there. And you can also um, request free professional learning for your school or district, as long as you are a public school or district here in the state of South Carolina. Well, um, as many of you know, we have a bill that's been debated here in the South Carolina uh, State House, um, Bill H-4624, and we've talked with a parent um, earlier this year, uh, Jessica Spearman, about um, transgender health care and why that's important for her and her family. And as we were talking about that, I stumbled across a video from a professor from Stanford, and it was just really, really illuminating. I have this sort of moral position on making sure that we support uh, trans students, trans educators, so that they can uh, be affirmed and have their identities affirmed so that uh, we don't uh, uh, make worse any kind of mental health issues or feelings that they don't belong or feelings of marginalization. And so I felt like when, as soon as I saw this video, I thought this is really a great piece of information for us to be equipped with as we debate folks around these issues impacting uh, our students and, and teachers who are trans. So I thought I would uh, invite him. I didn't know if he would say yes, because he's a he's on he's been on so many podcasts uh, um, and he's just uh, probably in high demand. But he said yes. So here's who he is. He's a, he's a neuroendocrinology researcher and author. He's a professor of biology, neurology, neurological sciences, and neurosurgery at Stanford University. He's received numerous awards uh, for his work, including a MacArthur Fellowship in 1987, an Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, and the Klingenstein Fellowship in Neuroscience. He was also awarded the National Science Foundation Presidential Young Investigator Award, the Young Investigator of the Year Awards from the Society of Neuroscience, uh, the International Society for Psychoneuroendocrinology and the Biological Psychiatry Society. So without further ado, let's bring on the star of tonight's show, uh, Dr. Robert Sapolsky. Robert, how are you doing tonight? Okay, very good. And thanks for having me on, Todd. I'm delighted to be able to put in my two cents about this issue. Thank you. Um, so I watched this video. You were you were giving a lecture on the neurobiology around transgender um, human beings. And I thought it would be really helpful because I think people have like, they understand in this culture war kind of where they stand on it, but they're not, we don't have a lot of deep scientific understanding of what it means to be trans and the neurobiology um, that impacts us as human beings in terms of how we identify in terms of gender and our sexuality. Can you kind of briefly, or not briefly, but can you kind of summarize um, the research that you were sharing so that folks who are watching can, can understand that? Yeah, let me start off with some necessary caveats. It's not my own research. I'm not a neurobiologist who knows much about the subject. I just have to like teach a little bit about it every other year or so. So I try to keep up with the literature. I'm presenting what I view as the very solid science and with no advocacy or political agenda here, even though I do have a political agenda. And I'm delighted to hear that we have similar ones. Um, but just starting off, um, I think what I want to focus on a little bit about what is known about the transgender brain, but mostly to take people sort of hand-holding through this process of what we think of as biological sex coming in two flavors and only two flavors is a lot more complicated than that and a lot more multifaceted. And the standard view of you know, one or the other, Coke or Pepsi, A or B, um, is in fact far less clear than is actually the case. That is much more a continuum 
when we think about what counts as sex. And I'm using sex here in the biological sense, you no know, rat sex, monkey sex, all of that, as opposed to the social construct of gender. So I'm, I'm definitely coming at this as a hard assed scientist. Yeah. So, so how do you, in, when, when this conversation takes place, I think that's one place where we need to start is, is making that distinction between biological sex and, and gender. And, uh, I think it's easier to see how gender is a social construct. I think it's harder for people to understand, uh, the nuances of the differences in biological sex and not seeing it as this, just, just one, just binary. Can you help people understand how, let's start, first of all, understanding how bio, bi, uh, biological sex is not just binary, it's not just male and female, as a lot of people want to claim. Okay. It's interesting stuff. Okay, so what's, if, if you, like, stayed awake through high school biology and remember any of it, there's a very classic picture of what sex determination is like and how it is you wind up having boys and girls and never the twain shall meet. And it's this very clear cascade, starting with your chromosomes. You're either XX, in which case you're female, or XY. That's all you got to work with. It's only those two flavors. Your chromosomal sex then determines what kind of gonads you have. And again, the standard view, the textbook view from back when is it's completely dichotomized. Either you get ovaries or testes. If you're XX, you get ovaries. If you're XY, you get testes straightforward. Then gonadal sex leads to endocrine sex, what hormones you're secreting. And again, clear dichotomy. If you're XX with ovaries, you're secreting estrogen and progesterone. If you got testes, XY instead, it's testosterone. That leads to genital sex in the fetus. Do you got a vagina or do you have a, a penis? And finally, secondary sexual stuff like beards and how thick your larynx is and what your brain is like and all. And this is the classic one. And everybody learns this. And it's a straightforward sort of path to concluding there's two sexes. These are two totally dichotomized biological systems. And what winds up being incredibly interesting is that every step along the way here, chromosomes to gonads, to hormones, to genitalia, to secondary sexual characteristics, it's not so dichotomized. It's something a little bit more like on a continuum. Interesting. So explain that continuum, like explain, so what is it that creates that continuum? How, how should we look at it instead of this, this view that a lot of us grew up with or, or, or understanding? How does, how, how, what are some examples of ways that it's not dichotomous? Okay. Chromosomal level, you know, everybody's either XX or XY that turns out not to be the case. There's all these admittedly rare variants of chromosomal sex. You can have XYY, XXY, XXYY, all of these rare ones. So uh, these are complicated and an X, an X does not guarantee a female appearance, a Y does not guarantee a male. All. So there's a lot of variety at that level. This isn't the most interesting stuff. Where things begin to get more interesting is now looking at the next level, gonads. Yeah, they come in two flavors. It's totally clear. It's not so clear. There's a whole bunch of disorders out there where you get something kind of in between. One where you wind up with people who have a womb and fallopian tubes and testes whoa, those are not supposed to all go together. There's another one called ovotesticular disorder where you get something that's kind of a chimera mixture of ovary and testes. And this thing makes estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. And so you can get this sort of thing. Next step further down. Okay, 
Estrogen, if you're female, you secrete estrogen and progesterone, and that's it. No, it turns out if you're female, you also secrete a certain amount of testosterone from your adrenal glands. If you're a male, you only secrete androgens. Nah, you secrete a certain amount of estrogens, and some of the effects of hormones in the brain are by way of that. Okay, so that's not completely clear. Then you get to the area that's really interesting in terms of genitals. So chromosomes to gonads to all of that, to, are you going to wind up having a penis or a vagina? And that seems very straightforward. And it's not so straightforward. And there's this whole world of intersexuality out there, um, which winds up being a debate. Are we talking about disease or are we talking about natural variation, which in a lot of ways is what it's about. Okay, two examples. First one, something called testicular feminization syndrome. It's got a fancier medical name these days, but it's like this irresistible phenomenon and like there's got to be all sorts of made for TV movies about this. You got a daughter, you got a perfectly normal daughter. Things are fine. Things are going great. She's growing up. You know, she's 10 or 11. A couple of her classmates are beginning to get their periods, whatever. She's 12. Most of her friends are getting their first cycles. She's not. It's, a, it's not a big deal, but she's feeling a little bit weird about it. Another year goes by rest of the kids still not what's up. What's wrong with me? Why am I not? normal. Of course, that word's got to come out. So you take her to a doctor and the doctor examines her and everything seems like she's going through puberty and she's got a vagina in the right place and all that. And the doctor goes poking around and eventually sits you down and says, well, fortunately, there's no scary disease here. You have a perfectly healthy child, but your child happens to be a son. Your child is chromosomally XY. Your child has testes up in his stomach. Your child secretes testosterone, so much testosterone that it's like leaking out of his ears. What's it? There's a mutation for a gene that codes for a thing called the testosterone receptor. You got lots of testosterone, but your cells can't hear it and you wind up with a female phenotype. You wind up with somebody who, you know, up until you had your daughter checked out there, um, you thought was a daughter. And what's typically done with this, this is a like a clear cut one. Sometimes it's a little more ambiguous than that. Um, what the like most humane medical thing is to not say, oh my God, you have a son, but to say you have a totally healthy child who happens she will never be able to have a child because, because she has no ovaries, because there's a fertility problem here. So that one's out there. Then there's an even weirder one. Uh, <clears throat> And this is, again, a mutation. This one is called 5-alpha reductase deficiency. And it's found in this one inbred population way up in the mountains in the Dominican Republic and another population way up in the mountains in New Guinea. Like medical geneticists, like like love the highlands of New Guinea because you get these isolated populations up there and inbreeding and you get all sorts of interesting mutations. So here's one of these interesting ones. You give birth to a daughter and everything's fine and all of that. And right around puberty, she suddenly converts into having male genitalia and a male appearance, a male phenotype. What's up with this? This is this mutation and this enzyme that makes testosterone for you. And this is a chromosomal male who simply was not secreting much testosterone up until around puberty when there was enough of a surge of it that you have a change. You have a change and you get this transition from like a vagina to a penis or whatever. And, you know, this is something that occurs now and then. It's extremely rare. For my money, the most interesting thing about it is in both of these populations, just on an anthropological level, people deal with it. It's, you know, I don't know, one out of a hundred births or something like that. And it's just like, you know, you hit puberty, some 
sometimes you get acne, sometimes you get a penis and you didn't have one of those before and whatever. And let's just go about business, cultural adaptation to this. But the point is, that's another one where you have a continuum. And I'm sorry, let me just, I, I yeah. thought Vanessa White made a really good point here. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. Um, she said that it's interesting, they're considered disorders. And I heard you use the word disease disorder syndrome. Is this, are those some words maybe we need to move away from? Like if someone has a blue and a brown eye, we do we call that a disorder just because it's rare? Or like, what are your thoughts on, on, on the terminology around these, uh, I don't know if we call them conditions or genetic anomalies. It is like a fantastic question because who gets to decide what's normal and how much variation is there around it and what counts as like normal human variability versus a disease and who decides if this is it. Yeah, this is like a perpetual massive challenge in the field. And often what it revolves around is, well, just how prevalent is this? How many people are there out there? And this is where an astonishing factoid comes in. So you have these individuals. It's very rare with this testicular feminization syndrome that it's absolutely, unarguably a female genitalia or with this, this isolated population. Often you get elements of both. You get somebody who is intersexual, somebody who has elements of both and where it's often ambiguous at birth if they actually are male, male or female. How often is this walk around on the streets of your community or whatever and, you know, walk past the maternity ward and the odds that a child has been born there with sexually ambiguous genitalia is greater than the odds that walking around your town, you've walked past someone with an IQ of 140 or higher. Interesting. There's a higher prevalence of sexually ambiguous genitalia at birth than there is of, you know, somebody who's two standard deviations out in their IQ or whatever. So having an IQ of 141, a disease, no, it's just a very rare version of normal human variability. And, you know, Disease labeling is often in the eyes of the beholder, and there's endless remarkable stories and sort of history of medicine of people who have a disease where you can fix them, and it turns out they don't think they have a disease, and they're doing just fine, and like great stories with that. So sexually ambiguous genitalia, does 1% to 2% of the population, is that an anomaly? Is that a quirk? I don't know, 2% of the population walks outside and sneezes because the sun is bright. Um, one of those, is that a disease? Is that an idiosyncrasy? Is that normal? Very, and this is where this stuff is getting into the, not just the beholder, but the eyes of those who get to hand out the designations. I wanted you to, uh, I, I apologize for the interrupting your flow there, but you were con going, continuing on through the sort of systems of the, the laying out the biological differences that are not dichotomous. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, this takes us then to the last step. So, you know, chromosomes don't just come in two flavors, gonads don't, which hormones you're secreting, what your genitalia look like, all of that. So then you get to like other organs in the body. And just given that I've been a neuroscientist since I was in diapers, the thing I'm most interested in is, so what's going on in the brain? Is there a male brain? Is there a female brain? And there's like so many conferences on this and so many fist fights that have happened at then and all over years. And are there differences in the brain? Absolutely. Based on sex? Nah. Are there differences in the brain that are statistical, that are probabilistic? You look at a whole population of males or female fish or brine shrimp or humans or whatever. And are there statistical differences with big overlap? Absolutely. And where do you fit transgender individuals into that picture? So the question becomes what are the sex differences in the brain and they're all over the place you see 
differences in the size of this part of the brain depend on the differences in how much white matter there is here and the amount of this brain chemical made all these and every single one of them is statistical you can't look at a human's brain and look at any of these sexually dimorphic brain regions and be able to say with any confidence, any accuracy, this person's male, this person is female. There's tremendous overlap in it. So that's the first thing about it. The next complication there with that is this is like, it's hard to decide if this is just sort of like a great tidbit for cocktail conversation or if how meaningful this is, but there is something called microchimericism in the brain. Mm. If you were a woman and you have given birth to a son while you were pregnant with that son, some of his stem cells got into your circulation and got incorporated into your body, including mm. your brain. You have neurons up there that are XY, while the rest of you, or most of the rest of you is XX. Conversely, you are a male fetus, and it goes in the opposite direction as well. Some of your mother's stem cells you've incorporated, including into your brain. So this is amazing, this microchimerism by sex in the brain. It's not clear how important that is versus how just cool it is that that happens. Um, but amid the sex differences in the brain, there's lots and lots and lots of them. So the question now becomes, so what's up with the brains of people who are transgender? And big surprise, this has been incredibly difficult to study because social stigma, because it's tough to study the brain, because in this case, what you really want to do ideally is study someone who says, yes, 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 I am the wrong sex. I have always felt as if I am a them instead of a me. And you get them before they've taken any hormone treatments or things like, because that's going to change the brain in and of itself. So that's a complication. So you wade through that and there winds up being a small, really carefully done literature. And it shows you something amazing. You've got somebody who, for example, was born male and they say, yeah, so what? I've always felt like I am female. I have always felt like it. And you look in their brain and you look in some of these sexually dimorphic areas. And what you see is in a lot of those regions, their brain looks in those regions, looks more female than male. Interesting. And how does that, how do, when you say looks more male than female, let's put a like kind of zoom in on that for a second. What, what do you mean? What, what exactly looks different? Oh, this is like such obscure stuff. You got this little sub area of the brain that four people on earth care about and you figure out the volume of it. And there's like a sex difference in the volume. And this individual will be more in the direction of the female average than the male average amid great overlap. And then you get somebody who born female says, nonetheless, I've always felt male. And you look in their brain and not in all of these areas of the brain that show sex differences, but in some of them, what you see is, you know, you got somebody who is, you know, Pepsi flavored sex, according to their chromosomes and gonads and hormones and genitals and everything else, but who nonetheless has always been saying, I don't feel like Pepsi, I feel like Coke. And you look in their brain and in some of those areas, it's more like Coke. And thus you get this sort of decision, like which counts for more. And, you know, for my money as a neurobiologist, if your brain in some ways is matching what you say you have always felt like you are, like who cares about what's going on down in your gonads or whatever. This is a far more meaningful thing. Um, yeah. So I think biologically what we're seeing is some of the time when you get people who say emphatically from day one, I have always felt like I am this other gender, I'm this other sex. You look in their brain and amid this is statistical stuff and trends and all of that, blah, blah, blah. You look in there and a lot of features of the brain look more like the sex they say I have always felt like rather than the one that every bit of textbook biology says they actually are. 
Right. So this is kind of dispelling this. There's this myth that it's a people will say that they're mentally ill. Um, and then the other piece that I wanted to ask you about, I know you spent a lot of time studying primates. I watched a video where you said you you knew you were going to study primates at the age of eight. Um, is Do we see this in the natural world? Do we see these biological um, anomalies? I'm going to use that word for now. Um, biological anom anomalies with sex. And do we see also um, any evidence of sort of transgenderism in the animal kingdom? Um, yeah, not with primates. I, it's baboon studying them. I, I, in addition to being a lab neurobiologist, I spent 33 summers in a national park in East Africa studying wild baboons and going back to the same guys each year. And over the years with these, I don't know, maybe 500 baboons who wound up being, there was one guy who I'm convinced had a genetic disorder called Klinefelter syndrome, which is kind of an intersexual, whatever. So something like that. I've never seen a baboon change sex, but there's hundreds of fish species that change sex opportunistically. So your the social structure in your species, black hamlet fish, that species is coming to mind. You get a whole bunch of females with a single breeding male and somebody comes along and devours the breeding male. And over the next couple of weeks, the highest ranking female in the group transitions to being male. Interesting. There are fish species that pair bond, that mate together for life, and they take turns switching sex. So who's carrying the cost of pregnancy? And they switch back and forth. So, yeah, this is like, you know, zoology. You look in the animal kingdom, there's always amazing ways of discovering that, like, what we think of as the norm isn't necessarily the case out there in terms of what evolution has come up with. So, yeah, you see that out there. Um, so never with a baboon, but nonetheless, you know, in terms of you, like even citing the people who are resistant to this trans stuff and all, and going on about, no, this is a psychiatric disorder. This is a malady. Um, I should point out about 50 years ago, the American Psychiatric Association had a meeting and a bunch of people sat around and they made a decision. And as a result of that, overnight, probably 30 to 40 million Americans were cured of a psychiatric disorder mm. when they decided that being gay is not a psychiatric disorder. Oh, for every we a label of psychiatric disorder is like meaningless. Oh, I don't know, five to 15% of the population had this psychiatric disorder. And then like this wonderfully therapeutic meeting, they said, <laughs> this isn't, this isn't a disease. This is not a psychiatric disorder. So we certainly have a history of normal human variation, getting a pretty heavy duty pathologic label by the people who get to hand out the labels. Um, so nothing about what we know of the biology that's going on in the brain in here puts us remotely in the ballpark of like nonsense of psychiatry. The impact of growing up with a brain that disagrees with the rest of your body as to what sex you have and society's treatment of you and the likelihood of you being subject to hate crimes, et cetera, et cetera, that sure may wind up landing you in the chair of a psychiatrist, um, but not for reasons that this is a psychiatric disorder because it's not a disorder. It's variability. So in our state of South Carolina, they're debating this bill, House Bill 4624, um, which would basically end gender affirming care, access to gender affirming care would also require all public school educators to notify the parents immediately if they suspect a student is experiencing gender dysphoria, which I don't know how you are qualified as a classroom teacher to identify a student. Like that. <laughs> is it because like uh, maybe a, a male student comes in with their fingernails painted? Like how do you determine like as a non psychiatrist or a non, you know, not really, I mean, equipped or knowledgeable enough to identify that, to do that in the first place. But what are your feelings on that kind of legislation that would ban gender affirming care and also require educators to, uh, quote unquote, out their students? Well, 
well, you know, I'm, I study neurons and dishes. So the last thing I'm going to do is say anything about policy, but there's no scientific basis on it. I'm not anywhere going into the debate at what age should somebody start their transitional say hormone treatment and is it okay before puberty after you know that is a biological question but 99 percent of the time that's a socio-political question and right. punching it out over that so i'm not going <laughs> near that one but yeah. like ooh, do you out a kid because you think they think differently from everyone else. Do you out a kid? You know, no surprise. I'm not very enthusiastic about what your fair state's legislature seems to be contemplating. What else do we need to know about before we move on to the next subject? What else do we need to know about the neurobiology of transgender people to better uh, understand this issue to better to be just more informed and to, for me, it's about showing compassion and love to, to fellow human beings, um, making sure we're not causing harm first, but also creating cultures and environments where all people feel welcome and safe. Um, what, what else, what else scientifically do we need to know to bolster that type of movement? Um, just remembering whether it's sexual identity or sexual orientation, or any of these things, it is very rare that the natural world gives us totally clear-cut dichotomies. Um, it's always messier than that, or that could be reframed as it's always more interesting than that. It's always more variable than that. There's more variety floating around out there. Um, and I think sort of, you know, as kind of a punchline for making sense of the brain stuff versus the rest of the body transgenderism. Um, the way people have traditionally thought about trans individuals is this is someone who for some reason thinks they're a different sex than what they actually are. What the neurobiology suggests instead is this is someone who has had the incredibly crappy luck of being handed a body that happens to be a different sex than who they actually are. Because if you got to choose between like what chromosomes you got in your liver and how your brain thinks about what your brain is, um, I'd vote for the brain every time. These are people who like, I don't care my chromosomes and my gonads and my hormones and my genitals. And I don't care if I'm far more at threat for dying from hateful crimes. Or whatever. This is how I have always felt. Listen to their brain, not their orifices. So uh, uh, that leads us to a conversation about um, choice and free will. And I know you've, uh, you've, you talk about this extensively. Um, and uh, if I, I don't want to, uh, I, I think I'm comfortable in saying you're a hard determinist. Um, uh, one of my best friends, Dr. Matt Talbert, is a compatibilist at West Virginia University. And he, we, we talk about free will quite a bit. And um, when it, as it's related to this subject, you know, there are people who will say, well, it's a choice. And one of the things he said, well, even if it is a choice, it, even if it is a choice, even if we do have free will, it's not anybody else's business what people choose you're not causing harm to anybody else um what let's just talk about um determinism a little bit you have that book determined and we'll, we'll put it up on the screen later um um what is why do you make the case for uh, everything being d determined well because when you look closely at what happens when you've just done something you've just behaved. You've just chosen a flavor of ice cream. You've just decided whether or not to pull a trigger. And when you're trying to figure out where did that behavior come from, uh, you look at the nuts and bolts of how that works. And there's no room in there for how we conventionally think of as free will. Okay. So somebody's just done something. They just pulled a trigger and why did they do that? And you're asking what went on in their brain a second ago. You're also asking like what their environmental stimuli were like in the previous minutes. 
You're asking, are they hungry, tired, stress, afraid, whatever? You're also asking what their hormone levels were like this morning. You're asking, were they traumatized by something five years ago? You're asking about their adolescence, childhood, fetal life, where your fetal environment has big influences on what kind of brain you're constructing. You're asking questions about your genes. And amazingly, you're also asking questions about the culture that this person was raised in because that culture, what their ancestors were up to when inventing that culture, had an enormous amount to do with how this individual's mother mothered them within minutes of birth. And you look at all these steps in there, and what you see is all we are is the sum of the biology over which we had no control, and its interactions with environment that we had no control over either. And when you look at how that stuff works, you turn to someone who insists nonetheless there's free will, there's responsibility, there's culpability, there's earning your treatment, there's deserving, there's justice being served. You turn to one of them and say, okay, show me with the brains and hormones and genes and culture and all that. Show me how free will works where your brain just did something completely independent of all that other biology stuff, show me how that works. And you've just proven there's free will and you can't show that. Yeah. I, uh, the reason why I want to talk about this with educators, and I feel like we don't talk about it in, nearly enough in our schools of education or in any professional learning, uh, uh, environments. Um, it seems like the school system is built around a more libertarian view of free will with its rewards and punishments. Like we can reward students and punish them and sort of, you know, help them develop the morally. And we label kids, good kids, bad kids, instead of just looking at the behaviors. And, and one of the things that has given me hope is, and you've talked about the ACEs study, adverse childhood experiences, and uh, this new trauma informed lens that we're looking uh, at things through, which, which is changing the, question from what's wrong with you. And I think I'm paraphrasing Dr. Bruce Perry here, but what's wrong with you to, to what happened to you. And I think, so I think we're going to have a hard time convincing most teachers to be hard determinists tonight, but if we can maybe move the needle like a little bit away from that libertarian view um, to, I think it would help us sort of drop some of this judgmental language that we have and really take a close look at the retributive type of system that we have in disciplining students and rewarding students um, to, to really get to the root causes of what causes maladaptive behavior. And I yes. think we're, we're more likely to get there if we, if we do that, which is why this conversation is so important. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I completely agree, <laughs> conveniently. Um, th that's wonderful. I mean, when you look at, you know, wh whether you're studying humans or tadpoles or something, every now and then reward is an effective tool for changing behavior. Punishment is an effective tool. They're great instrumental devices, but we run a world in which punishment and retribution in some domains and praise and reward in other domains are viewed as virtuous in and of themselves. And there's no science that supports that. That's simply not the case. And when you get that stuff out of the way, when you get the fact that punishing feels good, there's a neurochemistry to that that's fascinating, that praise is very rewarding. When you clear all that stuff out, what you see is, you know, each time we figure out that, oh, this is something that person actually had no control over. They're doing this simply because of how they turned out to be the sort of person they are through things they had no control over. When you do that, the world becomes much more humane. And I think educators uh, are in a particular position to appreciate it. I'm, I'm in my mid 60s and I look like I'm probably older than you. So you may not have been of this era, but I grew up in a time where if the kid sitting next to you in school was just not learning how to read and they just, there was an explanation. There was an attribution, whether you were sitting next to them or you were the teacher or the parent or the guidance kind of whatever, which is the kid's not very smart or they're not very motivated or they can't pay attention or they're like 
an attribution built around free will. And then somebody discovered this thing called dyslexia. It's like a goddamn piece of machinery in your brain is messed up. The architecture in one area of your cortex winds up being screwy on this microscopic level. And thus, maybe you wind up being the type where you have trouble telling the letter B from the letter D because they flip over on you. And you have a learning difference at that point. You have, you have a label, you have a biological, you have a, oh, they're not lazy. They're not unmotivated. You have this. And all that has happened since then is that's a great thing. That's a wonderfully humane discovery. And, you know, these endless 40 year olds who say, yeah, I finally got a, a learning difference diagnosis last year. I've got dyslexia, all that. God, I wish someone had figured that out when I was eight right. because I've just grown up thinking, why was I such a lazy, unmotivated person? Why? Right. You, why do you turn out to have a really unappealing personality that's off putting to people when no, actually, you're on the autism spectrum? Why is it that no matter how much you try, you are overweight? No, you have a metabolic profile that means that you don't find food to be satiating at every one of these steps. When we subtract that out of the picture, and teachers are in the front lines of the trenches of whether or not this goes in a good direction or bad. Every time that's been sorted out, the world becomes a more humane place. It's a much better world that we don't teach kids with dyslexia that they're lazy and stupid. Yeah, the metaphor I use when we, we talk about these things as I introduce these concepts to teachers is I'll have a picture of a, two, two of the same exact plants and one is growing quite well and the other one's like droopy and looking like it's going to die and i say okay so what do you, what can you say about these these plants what can we definitively say what might be right with this one and wrong with what's going on with this one and and i'll say is is it because the plant the plant on the right the one that's droopy is it because it's lazy or because it's morally like corrupt like there's some kind of it's a bad plant like what is what's going on here and they start to see that it's no it's a, it's the causes and conditions that that led to one plant growing, you know, well, and the other one struggling. And I, and I said, so, so why are we with students so, so quick to, to judge and label them and to create these more moral values? Like you said, laziness, or they're just, they're just a bad kid when we're instead, of, cause that's like, to me, that's the, that's the cop out. It's the shortcut and lazy way of looking at this. And it's much more complicated and challenging, I think. For us to really investigate what's going on with this child like what what have they experienced in their in their childhood you know let's look at their physical health their mental health their, their history what their environment is at home you know what's going on with them socially at school to sort of figure out because that's how we get to a place where we can help improve the life of that child by judging them it, we're not we're not getting anywhere um it, we just try to like hit them over the head with some kind of moral condemnation and and that to me is not the kind of humane world that um, that we, I think both of us want. Yeah, and that's that's a wonderful metaphor. The, the one I always fall back on is, you know, you have a car whose brakes have stopped working. It's dangerous. It's gonna run somebody over, it's gonna kill somebody. You gotta get it off the street. You don't say, ooh, the car had no control over having bad brakes, so just let it keep driving around. You gotta protect, society. but you put it in a garage and you put a lot of effort into trying to cure its broken breakness. And if you don't know how to do that, you put a lot of effort into trying to understand root causes of how some cars come to have broken brakes. But you don't go in every day with a sledgehammer into your garage and bash the car on the top because it's got a rotten soul having its brakes not working. And you know, that's exactly what we have to do. And a lot of people recoil at this saying, oh my God, that is so dehumanizing to use a car with broken brakes metaphor, just turning us into a bunch of machines. That's a hell of a lot better than sermonizing us into being sinners. Right, right. Um, along with this conversation of free will is always the conversation of moral responsibility and blameworthiness. And um, one of the things that I think... Uh, 
people automatically go to is they're saying, well, if we if we don't have free will, why do we why do we hold anybody accountable? Why do we put anybody in jail? Why do we why would we you know put a kid out of school or whatever, like suspend them from school? And I remember in one of the videos I watched from you, you were saying that, like, you know, we, we can quarantine p- people who commit dangerous acts so that we're protecting each other. That doesn't mean that we have to yeah, simultaneously, you know, brand them and judge them. Can you out- outline a little bit about your thoughts on moral responsibility? Yeah, this is this is where I really wind up out in the lunatic fringe of this stuff, because, you know, I'm not just saying there's less free will than people normally think. I'm saying actually I don't think there's any free will whatsoever. And if you really, really, really think that through, it means that blame and punishment never make any sense. Praise and reward never make any sense. No one is entitled to anything more than anybody else is entitled. Nobody has earned anything. All of that are the only logical outcomes of that. And yeah, right. Let's go like run the world that way. That's going to be incredibly difficult. You know, I've been thinking this way since I was an adolescent and I can actually function this way maybe once every third month or so for a few (laughs) weeks. It's incredibly hard. Um, Nonetheless, you got to push it step by step. And this stuff seems inconceivable, but all the time we have figured out ways how to subtract responsibility out of stuff and the roof doesn't cave in. Here's, here's an example that's so obvious it doesn't even occur to us that this has something to do with the free will debate. 200 years ago, most like thinkers in the West would have said there's a relationship between somebody's moral goodness and their health. Disease is a sign of God's disapproval. Disease, illness as a moral stain, illness as an external manifestation of an internal moral stain. Yeah, so people used to think that way. And now we have a domain where we've subtracted out free will relevant to this in a way where we've done it so completely. You don't even realize this is relevant. You're an airline pilot. You're an airline pilot and you get hay fever in the spring and you take antihistamines for a few days. And because of how antihistamines work, you feel drowsy afterward. And there's a quarantine law in the airline industry, which is if you're taking antihistamines, you can't fly for a few days. Whoa. Oh my God. We've gone from illness as a moral failing to, you know, it's just, you can't fly for a few days when you're taking antihistamines. You don't have a rotten soul that you have hay fever, but like you keep your kid home from school if they have a nose cold before they get everybody sick. You don't take your kid's toys away that day when they're sitting at home. You just, and you sure like hope somebody figures out how to make a hay fever medication that doesn't make you drowsy or why you're kid got a cold in the first place. But we've done that in so many realms, we don't even recognize we've done that. Wow, all of us recognize that humans don't have the free will power to control the weather. Hmm. 400 years ago, we would have thought that's the case. And thus that horrible thunderstorm was due to that witch who did a potion and let's burn her at the stake. All we've done is recognize all these domains where it turns out there isn't free will. So let's just keep doing that because if it was 50 years ago, that kid, you would have viewed them with the sincerest, best intentions in your liberal, introspective mind as a kid who's not very motivated and really isn't paying much attention. And now there's a completely different attribution and we got there. We got there from witches 400 years ago. We got there from learning differences from 50 years ago. Well, just keep pushing it. I got three more questions. One's real quick, I think is a powerful argument for our lack of free will, which is that I think I'm not a neuroscientist, so so please correct me in my understanding of this, is that you can see neurons firing, making the choice that you're going to make prior to your conscious the part of your brain aware that your those that choice has been made. Can you just talk about that briefly about how that works so that people understand that? Yeah, this is like one of the most famous 
understood, misunderstood studies ever. Um, this famous one where supposedly you're monitoring what's going on in somebody's head and electroencephalography, more recently brain imaging type stuff. And you ask somebody, when did you first become aware? When did you decide to push this button? And the original study said, you can tell by what's happening in the brain a half second before that they've decided to, ooh, your brain has decided before you have. You think you've made that choice. And people have been fighting about this when this study was in the 80s. And there's still conferences where people scream at each other as to whether or not this disproves free will. My money is, it's totally interesting stuff, but it's completely irrelevant to the free will debate because who cares when exactly you formed the intent to press that button or pull that trigger? The only question to ask at that point is, how did you become the sort of person who would form that intent at that moment? And that's where one second before, one hour before, one lifetime before becomes relevant. Um, you know, we make choices all the time in the moment. We have a conscious intent and we act on it. And we know we could have done otherwise. And that's not free will. Because the only thing to ask is, how did you turn out to be the sort of person who would form that intent? Just saying whether or not you form that intent a half second before this or that part of the brain is like trying to review a book and all you've done is read the last paragraph of it. Mm. So it seems difficult to argue from a scientific perspective against free will, but let, let me just throw out like a, a hypothesis here. What... It seems like like people have to insert some type of metaphysical or something something outside the system kind of I don't know soul spirit in order for you to say that you actually have free will that we just can't observe that. Um, so I, my question is, uh, I think it was Nick Bostrom, Oxford University, uh, talked about a simulation theory. So let's say, for example, that there is that we are avatars in this simulation and that there is a there was a version of us playing us or some, something playing us, um, would that insert the possibility for free will back in? Like there's the, there's the Pac-Man going around the Pac-Man screen, but there's the player, and maybe within the Pac-Man system, you can't see or observe the player, but that player has free will, but the Pac-Man seems like he doesn't. Well, this is falling back on yet another realm of a false dichotomy that, it's so easy. There's a difference between brain and body. There's a difference between brain and mind. There's a difference between emotion and cognition. It's this, when you really examine it closely, it's this completely, I'm not going to say medieval, but it's this notion that somewhere inside your brain, there's a me there's a me that's in there, but it's separate of all that stuff. It's, it's not made of brain yuck. It's made of something else. There's a separate me in there. And that is independent of it. And there's no separate me in there. Right. There's no separate one there. All we have is what comes out of the material building blocks that make us us. I mean, all we are is a bunch of atoms out there in the universe, blah, blah, that, you know, transiently come together to form this thing that we call me before like all of those atoms come apart into some other way. There's no separate me in there that's making decisions. That's not, that's in the brain, but not of the brain. I found that interesting. I had a, had a conversation with Chris Niebauer about, and it's just interesting that neuroscience and some of these Eastern spiritual traditions kind of intersecting a little bit about there is no subjective self. The self is just this, an illusion, or at least it's not what it appears to be. Uh, it's not this, uh, it's just a bundle of thoughts. Um, my last question to you is this, and this is just a thought experiment. So let's say we could prove that hard determinism is 100% correct. And then 100 years down the road, AI is so powerful that not only can we know precisely exactly why people make decisions, but we can examine their brain and know everything about their history, input it, and artificial intelligence can, with 99.99% .99 accuracy, map out the future, do we end up in like a minority report kind of scenario where like we arrest people because we know that there's a very high chance they're going to 
murder somebody or commit crime? Well, it should be pointed out that we do like Tom Cruise pre-crime interventions all the time. Your kid doesn't have to have gone to school and got everybody else sick with their sneezing for you to be able to have a, in anticipation of intervention there. And that fits that, but nonetheless, yes. And in the broadest sense, if we've got enough AIs under our belt and working in units, can we predict everything that's going to happen in the future? Which another way of asking that is if you were smart enough and showed up two seconds after the big bang, would you know exactly what the future was going to be? Would this not only mean this is a deterministic world, but this is a predetermined world? And the answer is no, it actually doesn't work that way because there are all sorts of things that are formally unpredictable. Chaoticism in systems, non-linearity, three-body problem in physics kind of thing. There's stuff that is not predictable, not because you don't have big enough of a microscope yet to really ooh, look at it up close, but will never, ever be predictable. And what that means is at any given moment, there are multiple possible futures, but once the particular future that winds up happening has happened, you could then see how it came to be, how the person who did that came to be the sort of person who did that at that moment. So the future is not set, which is great news because people get connections when you say, oh, there's no free will. And they say, oh, great. Are you saying nothing can ever change? It's already determined, so don't bother. No, things change dramatically. Um, and we should not for a second put less effort into trying to make things that need to be better, better, all of that. But once it happens, you will see where the machinery was that explains how that came about. It reminds me of like the observer effect on the double slit experiment a little bit. I don't know if I'm like that. There's this, this whole this possibilities. And then once the action, once that moment comes and it's observed, all the, all the possibilities collapse into one. Yeah. Um, or maybe stated a different way. It's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Interesting. Yeah. Well, we are running out of time. I want to give you an opportunity. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to share before we uh, sign off? Uh, no, this has been great. And I have tremendous admiration for here. I'm sitting in the Bay Area with our cushy, indulged liberal stances and all that. Like, you guys are out in a tough part of the country trying to convince people to see to see biology going on rather than somebody's soul having yeah. a spasm or things of that sort. Um, that's great that you guys are pushing against what your surrounding culture may be dictating. Well, we don't have to wait on other states to, uh, to do things or to lead the way we can, we can do that here in South Carolina. I think we can do that, um, anywhere where folks have a voice and, um, the capacity to communicate. So I just want to thank you for your time. I, I know you're, you're on, you're in high demand and, um, all, you have a lot going on, but I just want to thank you for your voice. And I've, I've watched so many of your videos in preparation for this and really just illuminating and helped me spark a lot of thought about how we're structuring schools and, and what we need to do at the, the foundational level to make sure that they are better environments for our teachers and students. So thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. And uh, good luck, all of you, with your state legislature. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. That's uh, Robert Sapolsky. I want to um, share with you some of the books that he's written. Um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, the, the acclaimed guide to stress, stress-related diseases and coping. And I really was would love to have a conversation with him about, about uh, the science around stress. Uh, we just didn't have time for that tonight. And then uh, the book Behave, The Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst. And his most recent book, uh, Determined, A Science of Life Without Free Will. I want to encourage you all to check those out. You can also find a ton of his uh, lectures on YouTube, and you can find him on a bunch of podcast episodes. All you have to do is search Robert Sapolsky. You'll you'll find tons of, of content. Um, speaking of, we talked a little bit about trauma tonight. 
If you'd like to learn more, just the basics around trauma-informed education, we're going to be hosting a, a workshop on July 11th from 10 to 3 at our headquarters with Karen Beeman, Jennifer Dollar, and Rona Neely. Uh, from, uh, Jen, Karen and Jennifer from Columbia College, they operate their Master's in Trauma-Informed Education program. Uh, you can learn more about that program as well if you're interested in that. Uh, and Rona is just a, a dynamic speaker who talks about some of the personal trauma she's experienced. And we, it helps us map the, the, the neuroscientific and psychological concepts onto real life stories, which I think is a really powerful way to, to, to teach this, this uh, content. Um, also want to remind you of Cool Coaching that's uh, available every Tuesday and Thursday nights from 6 to 8 o'clock. So if you're a teacher and you need some advice, some tips, you can work with any one of these three uh, amazing educators. Uh, that's at cool.us slash coaching. If you're interested in a uh, mindfulness retreat, we only have two spaces left. We have 18 of the 20 spots have been taken. We only have two left. So if you're interested, this is June 26th, the 28th. It's secular, it's science-based, it's trauma-sensitive. Um, go to cool.us slash retreat. And uh, another thing coming up related to this is Rona and her daughter, Kiania Brown, are going to be talking about healing trauma on a live stream coming up May 29th from 7.30 to 8 o'clock. Once again, I want to thank um, Robert Sapolsky, our guest tonight. Thanks to Vanessa White and to um, to everybody who tuned in tonight. I really appreciate um, everybody tuning in. And we will see you on the next live stream. And until then, have a great weekend. And thanks for all you do, educators. 